Hello dear children. So today we are going to study the story The Midnight Visitor from your book The Footprints Without Feet. It is written by Robert J. Arthur. Before we read the story, let us know something about the author. Robert J. Arthur was a writer of speculative fiction known for his work with the Mysterious Traveller radio series and for writing The Three Investigators, a series of novels. Arthur was honored twice by the Mystery Writers of America with an Edgar Award for the Best Radio Drama. He also wrote scripts for television such as The Twilight Zone and the Alfred Hitchcock's TV show Alfred Hitchcock Presents. The Midnight Visitor is a detective story written by Robert Arthur. The presence of mind is the most important quality a secret agent must have. Ausable, the hero of the story is one such secret agent. He expects to get some sensitive papers in his hotel room. Another secret agent, Max, threatens him with a pistol demanding the report. Does Ausable outwit him? Well, we are going to find this out in the story. So, let's begin the story. Ausable did not fit any description of a secret agent Fowler had ever read. Following him down the musty corridor of the gloomy French hotel where Ausable had a room, Fowler felt let down. It was a small room on the sixth and top floor and scarcely a setting for a romantic adventure. So here Fowler is a young writer who is fascinated with the world of secret agents and the murky business of intelligence agents. He has fixed an appointment with Ausable. He has never met him before. He has thought that Ausable would be living in a luxury hotels where spying agents indulge in their activities in the midst of much glamour and glitz. But when he meets Ausable and is escorted to the Fowler's tiny sixth floor ordinary room in a very ordinary hotel in Paris, he is clearly underwhelmed. To add to his disappointment, Ossibel turns out to be an obese man with a little charm and no smart youthful look. Fowler a bit surprised to see a short fat man in the profession of spies. He follows Ossibel to his room through a smelly and a bit scary corridor. Ossibel was for one thing fat, very fat. And then there was his accent. Though he spoke French and German passably, he had never altogether lost the American accent he had brought to Paris from Boston 21 years ago. So, Ossible was a very fat man and his accent was American, although he had been living in Paris for the last 20 years and could speak a bit of French and German. You are disappointed, Ossible said wheezily over his shoulder. You were told that I was a secret agent, a spy, dealing in espionage and danger. You wished to meet me because you are a writer, young and romantic. You envisioned mysteries, figures in the night, the crack of pistols, drugs and the wine. So Ossible tells Fowler that he would have been disappointed to see a spy living in such an ordinary environment. Fowler had expected to meet a secret agent, a spy agent who had been dealing with danger, crime scenes and drugs, but it was never so in this case. Instead, you have spent a dull evening in a French music hall with a sloopy fat man who instead of having messages slipped into his hand by dark-eyed beauties, gets only a prosaic telephone call making an appointment in his room. You have been bored. The fat man chuckled to himself as he unlocked the door of his room and stood aside to let his frustrated guest enter. So here he further continued that Fowler had to spend the evening in a music hall with an old, poorly dressed, extremely fat man who used traditional methods for making the information travel rather than beauties delivering to him. He then exclaimed that Fowler must have been bored with him and then he opened the door of his room and gave way to Fowler. You are disillusioned, Ossibel told him. But take cheer, my young friend. Presently you will see a paper, a quite important paper for which several men and women have risked their lives come to me. 
some day soon that paper may well affect the course of history. In that thought is drama, is there not? Then Osibel told Fowler that he had been thinking all wrong and the best part was yet to come as they would soon be coming across a paper for which a lot of men and women had risked their lives and that report was very important. As he spoke, Osibel closed the door behind him, then he switched on the light. And as the light came on, Fowler had his first authentic thrill of the day. For halfway across the room, a small automatic pistol in his hand stood a man. Osibel blinked a few times. Max, he wheezed. You gave me quite a start. I thought you were in Berlin. What are you doing here in my room? And then, you know, when Osibel closed the door behind him and turned on the light, as soon as the light was turned on, Fowler experienced his first thrill of visiting a secret agent as he saw a man with an automatic pistol standing across the room. Osibel recognized the man as Max and he asked him what was he doing in his room when he was supposed to be in Berlin. Max was slender, a little less than tall, with features that suggested slightly the crafty pointed countenance of a fox. There was about him, aside from the gun, nothing especially menacing. So Max was thin, a bit short, and his facial expressions looked a bit like that of Fox. He seemed harmless except the gun he was holding. The report, he murmured. The report that is being brought to you tonight concerning some new missiles. I thought I would take it from you. It would be safer in my hands than in yours. So Max said that he wanted the report about the missiles for which Osibel had been waiting for. He thought that he would be able to keep it more safely. This is said to create humour as he just wanted the reports for his own benefit. Osibel moved to an armchair and sat down heavily. I am going to raise the devil with the management this time and you can bet on it, he said grimly. This is the second time in a month that somebody has got into my room through that nuisance of a balcony. Osibel sat down on a chair and started speaking that he would definitely have a fight with the management of the hotel as this was the second time that someone had climbed up from the balcony of the room. Fowler's eyes went to the single window of the room. It was an ordinary window against which now the night was pressing blackly. Balcony? Max said with a rising inflection. No, a pass key. I did not know about the balcony. It might have saved me some trouble had I known. Now then the Fowler looked towards the window and saw that it was an ordinary window and that it was pretty much dark outside. Max said that he came through the master key and did not know about the balcony. Had he known about it, his work would have become much easier. It's not my balcony, Osibel said with extreme irritation. It belongs to the next apartment. He glanced explanatorily at Fowler. You see, he said, this room used to be a part of a large unit and the next room through that door there used to be the living room. It had the balcony which extends under my window now. You can get into it from the empty room two doors down. And somebody did last month. The management promised to block it off, but they haven't. Osibel continued that it was not his balcony, though uh, through which people had uh, tried coming in, but was of the next apartment. He then started explaining things to Fowler that his room used to be a part of a large unit and the room next to his room used to be a living room. Then he said that it had the balcony that came till the window of his room. He said that to climb up to his room, one needed to go to the empty room, which was two rooms away from his room and climb up the balcony. Then he said that somebody did climb up the balcony last month as well. He also told Fowler that the management had told him that they would surely get it blocked, but they still hadn't done so. Max glanced at Fowler, who was standing stiffly not far from Osibel and waved the gun with a commanding gesture. Please sit down, he said. We have a wait of half an hour, I think. 
Max asked Fowler to sit down as there was still half an hour for the report to reach Ossible. 31 minutes, Ossible said moodily. The appointment was for 12.30. I wish I knew how you learned about the report, Max. The little spy smiled evilly. And we wish we know how your people get the report. But no harm has been done. I will get it back tonight. Ossible joked that it was not 30 minutes but 31 minutes that were left for report to read him. The report was supposed to come in around 12.30 at night. Ossible said that he wished he had known how Max had come to know about the report coming in. Max smiled wickedly and said that he also wished to know how Ossible and his team had got that report. He added that he would take that report from Ossible straight to his team. What's that? Who is at the door? Fowler jumped at the sudden knocking at the door. Ossible just smiled. That will be the police, he said. I thought that such an important paper as the one we are waiting for should have a little extra protection. I told them to check on me to make sure everything was all right. Then suddenly a knock is heard on the door and Max panics. Fowler is also scared by the knock on the door. Ossible replied to Max's question about who was on the door that it must be the police because he had asked them to check on him after some time as he thought that the report he was about to receive was important and definitely required extra attention. He had asked the police to check on him after some time to ensure that everything was all right. Max bit his lip nervously. The knocking was repeated. What will you do now, Max? Ossible asked. If I do not answer the door, they will enter anyway. The door is unlocked and they will not hesitate to shoot. Max's face was black with anger as he backed swiftly towards the window. He swung a leg over the sill. Send them away, he warned. I will wait on the balcony. Send them away or I'll shoot and take my chances. Max became nervous about the situation. As the knocking continued, an Ossible asked him what would he do next. Ossible said that the door was unlocked and if he did not let him open the door, the police would enter anyway and would definitely shoot if they saw him with a gun. Max was angered by the situation and ran quickly towards the window. And he warned him to send them away and till that time, he would hide himself at the balcony. The knocking at the door became louder and a voice was raised. Mr. Ossible, Mr. Ossible. Keeping his body twisted so that his gun still covered the fat man and his guest, the man at the window grasped the frame with his free hand to support himself. Then he swung his other leg up and over the windowsill. When the knocking on the door grew louder and someone from outside called for Mr. Ossible twice, Max was sitting on the windowsill and was facing inside so that his gun could still be pointed towards Mr. Ossible and Fowler. Max then held the windowsill and sat at the sill with both legs outside. The door knob turned swiftly. Max pushed with his left hand to free himself from the sill and dropped to the balcony. And then, as he dropped, he screamed once, shrilly. The door opened and a waiter stood there with a tray, a bottle and two glasses. Here's the drink you ordered for when you returned, he said, and set the tray on the table, deftly uncovered the bottle and left the room. So the doorknob turned and Max thought that the police would be coming in. So he jumped from the sill to fall on the balcony and when he fell, a loud and shrill scream was heard. When the door opened, a waiter stood at the door with a tray, a bottle of wine and two glasses. He came in and kept everything on the table and said that it was the bottle that uh, Ossible had ordered for. He opened the cork of the bottle skillfully and left the room. White-faced Fowler stared after him. But he stammered, the, the police? There was no police, Ossible sighed. Only Henry, whom I was expecting. But won't that man out on the balcony? Fowler began. No, said Ossible. 
He won't return. You see, my young friend, there is no balcony. <laughs> Fowler did not understand what had happened and stammered that where was the police to which Ossible replied that there was no police and that he knew that it was Henry, the waiter and he was expecting him only. Then again Fowler asked about the man outside the window to which Ossible replied that he would never come back as there was no balcony and that Max had fallen on the ground from the top floor of the building. Actually, Ossibel, sensing the danger, had fabricated a story about the non-existing balcony which Max believed to be true. And in this way, he outsmarted Max. So dear children, what message do you get from this story? The ultimate message that one can get from the story is that and in any situation, we should not panic. Instead, we should take a step and face the situation with our presence of mind. The story highlights that wisdom is more powerful than other weapons. Ossible's intelligence is highlighted in the story. It also portrays that one should not judge a person by merely his appearance. Ossible is fat and lazy, but he is the most intelligent of all in the story. So I hope you like the story. So see you in the next video. Thank you.